The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, so uh, uh, first, uh, I, was, uh, uh, so I think uh, you should start thinking about uh, the um, project. And uh, what uh, I'm looking for uh, is a, a short report, paper type report. I want to limit to only five pages, OK? And uh, uh, you could be. Uh, Anything related to this subject, right? So if you happen to be working on something, you want to extend and apply the knowledge that you learn in this subject, you're welcome to do so. And in fact, uh, I um, wrote a paper uh, based on term paper uh, I was working on when I was a graduate student. I thought that that's, uh, that was a good experience, in fact. Uh, that turns out to be the first paper on thermal conductivity of quantum wells. Um, I was taking a nonlinear optics course. I spent uh, the whole semester, and uh, at the end, I went to a professor. I said, I don't understand what you talk. Uh, and he wanted that term paper. And I said, how about uh, um, he was talking about double sided Feynman diagram. So I. I still don't quite understand what, it, what uh, say the Feynman diagram, but uh, so I said, uh, how about I work on a paper on quantum wells, thermal conductivity of quantum wells? I said, fine, that's fine. So I wrote the term paper and uh, I continued to work on it, and uh, I eventually actually published a paper on the thermal conductivity of quantum wells. And uh, uh, looking back at there, because of that, let's say I was doing pretty much a Boltzmann equation. So completely forgot the quantization. But uh, uh, um, it turns out that most of the stuff were correct. Not everything was correct. And uh, uh, so uh, what I want to say is I encourage you to think about a subject related to your research. Uh, uh, you can expand it. Uh, or if you uh, uh, you're not sh uh, say you don't have a subject, uh, you can uh, do a literature review. Let me say you're interested in a specific topic. Let's say metamaterials or plasmonics or any any of the thing that we mentioned or you read, right? You are going to apply the knowledge. You can do a, a literature review and uh, expand on it. Maybe you say okay. Based on that, maybe this is a, a interesting problem that I can continue working on. You can work after this uh, uh, semester. Uh, you can always, you're always welcome to discuss with me. And if you really do, uh, say, don't have a, a, a topic, come talk to me. I think I can always uh, figure something. Uh, we can negotiate and say what it would be, it would be interesting. OK? Uh, so uh, that's uh, on the term paper. Uh, my uh, uh, so now you have uh, all turned in. I uh, say so your first uh, qu uh, first midterm and uh, redo it. Any questions on this first midterm? I think uh, say when I was uh, uh, looking at. Uh, uh, where uh, were uh, most mistakes made? I think uh, uh, one of this is the um, the depths of the evalescent wave, right? And uh, uh, probably uh, because unless you go back, you written down, and uh, it may not be easy to figure out what's the depths. But say the K is that you should be able to write down the plane wave expressions, right? And if you have the plane wave expression, and you use your Snell law, and uh, you can find the angle when the angle cosine theta, well, sine theta is larger than 1. So you use your cosine theta, 1 square root of 1 minus that sine theta square. 
and they plug in the plan wave, you should be able to find out what's the uh, penetration depth of the everlasting wave. And there was another question about uh, the, uh, what's the number of molecules have a certain speed, right? That's a gas molecule. And uh, so there, I would uh, guess, uh, probably you might be get stuck in, what's the total number of, you just need to start with the total number of molecules, all right, per unit volume, and that's the, first of all, you need to, given temperature, given pressure, you could use the ideal gas law to find out what's the local density, and, and then use the Maxwell velocity distribution to say what's the total number, what's the number of molecules that have a certain velocity. And uh, uh, then I think it's a matter of time. Um, most of you couldn't finish the last problem uh, where uh, we're looking at the uh, Folon, uh, say the equivalent of a Folon distribution uh, to the black body radiation, whereas the peak winds displacement is null, right? So uh, you find out that in many cases, uh, at low temperature, yeah, you do have a peak, but at high temperature, that wavelength, peak wavelength is too short compared to two times the lattice constant. So you actually never reach that peak. Uh, it, it will be, uh, you, you should uh, uh, continue to try that out. And uh, for many years, um, I haven't done that myself until this time I said I have to make a problem out of it. Uh, this is the optical absorption. Right? That's the second long, longer problem. Uh, what's the optical absorption for a direct gap semiconductor? And it's a matter of uh, joint density of states. So uh, if I have, right, so I have a semiconductor dispersion and I have a photon. This is the NIFT uh, electron uh, from, from the valence band to conduction band. And then you need to say, this is my photon energy, H omega uh, mu, and how is it related to K? So you, you need to fire first write down, because you know this parabola, this parabola, and the difference of these two energy gives you the photon energy, right? So once you have photon energy or frequency versus K, and you can use the um, normal way we do density of states, because the absorption depends on how many states you have, and this is, in fact, called the joint density of states between the valence band and conduction band. And then it turns out that it's the same as your bulk material. That's the square root of E minus e, uh, the band gap. Right? So uh, the absorption of the uh, uh, light uh, for uh, uh, typical semiconductor, this, is, uh, uh, this curve of absorption is a reflection of the joint density of states. And of course, you have the population, right? We didn't say, OK, you have to say how many electrons here, how many empty states here. If I do it, I really need to say this is the F and the here F for the number of electrons. Here, here is empty, so, so that's a one mass F. Right? That's a different F because there, if your chemical potential is here, and uh, you see the uh, say Fermi Dirac is uh, say energy minus mu, and here is uh, the valence band energy minus mu there, right? So uh, basically, uh, if you force yourself going through those problems, many times you can understand uh, a lot of the basics that you say. And I let, I did not do this before, and. Uh, uh, I, this time I said, OK, I'll give you problems. I have for, first to do it myself. Any questions? OK. Uh, so if not, then let's come back. And uh, uh, if we think what we were talking the last time, we talk about uh, this wave to the particle transition. And from that, I would say, from now on, I'm going to neglect the phase of the energy carriers. Uh, the plane wave, I'm, I'm not current, no longer carrying the phase. I'm just looking at the, the trajectory and treat them as uh, billables, right? So um, 
look at the trajectory. And uh, for that, we say we discuss briefly the Noble equation, which is a n particle distribution function. And that, I say, uh, it's a, of course, that n is huge, it's the number of particles in my system. And uh, we say, OK, from this Noble equation, there are generally two approaches. One is the Boltzmann equation. That's the, uh, uh, say, long developed. And the other is the linear response theory, uh, uh, which I hope I ha will have time at the end to cover some. If you do molecular dynamics, you should uh, really dive into linear response theory. That's the analysis. I, I commented a lot of people. In fact, uh, say any undergraduate student come in can conceptually understand F equal MA, F equal MA do a simulation. But the key is that you have to really understand the, the, the basis for that. And uh, so we move on and uh, say, OK, from uh, F to N and to F of 1, that's a one particle distribution function. That's a Boltzmann equation. And uh, uh, the Fn is just the multiplication of F1 for n particles. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the, because of the one particle, now this particle will interact with the rest of the particle in the system. So uh, the Boltzmann equation, uh, which you roughly can show from Novo equation, the left-hand side is df dt. The first derivative, because here is still a function in phase space, right? F is the distribution function, is still a function in phase space. So the first derivative is gradient is with respect to space. The second gradient is with respect to the momentum, right? And uh, uh, it's actually interesting to comment the F, it looks like a, it's a function of x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z. It looks like it has a direction. V, x, v, y, v, z. If a particle is going a certain direction, I have a different f, right? So, but uh, 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 see, uh, the question is, is it a vector or scalar? What do you think? It's a scalar in high dimensional space, right? And if you just think about uh, any point in space, and particle going specific direction have specific distribution. So that looks like it has direction properties. But that direction property is really the way coordinate, the higher dimensional coordinate, space, co uh, say phase space coordinate. OK, and also uh, there are different ways to write this fourth term. DPDT is the same, uh, the, uh, if you look at, think about the Newton's law, uh, DPDT gives you the F, the force. And the force can write the F, uh, say, because P is uh, MA, MV, so I can put the M out and the uh, F, uh, say, derivative with respect to V. Or P is a function of HK, right? So by, I can use different variables. Rather than using P, I can use a V, I can use K, and a different way of writing this term. And that's uh, most of the time, uh, say, when you deal with the electrons, you have to keep this term. That's the uh, uh, important driving force for the electron motion. But when we deal with photon or phonon, we do not need uh, this term, or even, say, the molecules. There's no direct force on them. Uh, but the complication is really on this left-hand side, right-hand side, where I see the, now the particle interact with the rest of the particle, and that's the collision term. So uh, let's move on and uh, try to write down this collision term, because uh, so far it looks all pretty simple. On the uh, right hand, uh, left hand side, you can say it's a first order derivative, right? And uh, so let's look at the collision term. Df dt, this is another derivative, just a symbol, how we can uh, express it. And uh, uh, normally, I can start just to consider the two-particle collision. And uh, so if I have 
two particles interact with each other, and this uh, initially this particle has an energy and momentum or v vector, right? Hk is momentum, and this other particle has a e1 k1, and uh, when they get close to the interaction range, what is close to interaction range? I mean, say if you think about two gas, uh, say uh, atoms. It's the electron when the electrostatic potential can interact with each other, right? So uh, uh, you have uh, electrons, you have nuclei, so you have that. That's where they start to interact. So if you think about the, the gas molecules in this room, we see the average mean free pass about 100 nanometer, right? And the, the atomic size is a few angstroms. So there is actually a very large space in between them. Most time they do not interact. They will just travel freely. And when they're getting really close to each other, you got this collision, right? So uh, due to the collision, you will have the energy change, maybe, right? And then you will change the direction. So that's the final state for this first, first particle. And you have the energy change of second particle and momentum change of the second particle. Right. And uh, in a typical problem, what do you want to say? Okay, what's the first, uh, what's the rate of, uh, what's the probability, what's the rate? Right. And the way uh, uh, to do this is a, a, a proximate method. So if you have, originally, if you solve a matter, for example, if I have photon comes in and getting absorbed by the uh, materials, getting absorbed by material, right? So originally, the material has a certain energy, and that's a quantum mechanical as the solutions, allowable energy levels. That's what we did in the second chapter, right? So we original problem, this system, before interaction has the energy, and correspondingly, we can write the uh, Schrodinger equation. Uh, essentially, we can write the Hamiltonian, which is the kinetic energy, so uh, h bar square uh, 2m k, uh, so it's uh, the operator, that's the first term in the Schrodinger equation, right? And uh, uh, plus u0, right? So when we solve the Schrodinger equation, we say this one equals mass i h bar, uh, i h bar d psi d, d, uh, dt. We solve for the energy states, right? So now uh, what I have, so this is, a, we did the steady state problem. Now during a uh, uh, photon comes in, what it does is to create a perturbation. You treat it as a small perturbation to the original Hamiltonian H. So uh, let's say this is your H0. And uh, the small perturbation, let's say uh, the, now the interaction uh, Hamiltonian H is H0 plus a small perturbation, which could be a function R and T. Right? This is the interaction term. This is the original unperturbed where I already have, suppose you already have the Schrodinger equation solution. You know the energy level, you know the wave function, the state, quantum states of the original system, right? And due to this perturbation, you go back to the Schrodinger equation, you solve using perturbation method. We're not going to do it. And with that, you can find the rate of perturbing due to this perturbation, the system changing from one state to the other. And this rate is the transition rate. This is from an initial state to a final state, right? And this is a 2 pi h bar. And uh, uh, we have the integration of the final state wave function complex conjugate 
the perturbation. So this is the the unperturbed system, the wave function. Let's suppose you start with a certain initial state uh, wave function and the final state wave function. That's suppose you already have solving the original problem. And now given this perturbation, Hamiltonian, and I have the initial state wave function, and I interact, integrate over the volume of that interaction. And this is square, and then a delta function, EI minus EF, which says the uh, uh, initial energy, the energy conservation delta function is zero when uh, the EI does not equal EF, right? So only when EI equals EF, this is non-zero. So essentially what this gives us is the energy conservation of the uh, system. And if you do this, if you say when you do the uh, wave function for plan wave, you have wave vector. Right? For each quantum state, you have wave vector. And if you do your integration of this, you'll also find a corresponding conservation in wave vector. That's your momentum conservation. So uh, what do you have? Uh, essentially, you will get the momentum and energy conservation from this transition rate. And uh, so the, uh, you, you have for example, the initial energy, so this is the two particles interacting. So this is initially E is a function of K, and the incoming one, E1, K1, equals E uh, prime, K prime. It goes scattered into another uh, state, and the E1 prime, K1 uh, prime. So that's the energy conservation. This is the delta function, the initial of the two system, two, two particles, and the final of the two particles. And uh, uh, the corresponding uh, energy conservation is K plus K1 prime equals K prime, that's the final, plus K1 prime final. And uh, Let's see, just wait, hold on this. And because it, HK, HK, that gives me momentum. And later on, I'll make a, I'll say a modification to this form. Here you can see this is a simple momentum conservation. But uh, later on, we'll add, uh, say in crystal, you add a reciprocal lattice G. And uh, uh, that's a so-called Umklang process. But basically, those transition rates also give you I uh, say uh, in the, doing the mass, also you actually get the energy and the momentum conservation. And uh, uh, most of the time, you can say uh, people do not like to write those integrals. That's why the Dirac, if you read the quantum mechanics book, they will write Dirac rotation. And uh, uh, the Dirac rotation for this is your initial state interacting. That's the, like a wave function here interaction with perturbed Hamiltonian and goes to final state. So that represents this integral. And uh, you have this integration. OK. And uh, you also write this as a matrix form, Fi square. So there are three different ways to do quantum mechanics. One is a matrix due to Heisenberg, Dirac rotation, Dirac. And Schrodinger is the Schrodinger equation. Okay, they are all equivalent. Okay, so this is the famous Fermi Golden Rule. Next time you you heard Fermi Golden Rule, you now at least you have seen. So that gives you the uh, transition rate from the initial to final this uh, uh, given the uh, uh, interaction Hamiltonian this is by solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation using the perturbation method. 
OK, so that's the first step, right? We say we're dealing with the collision. And uh, now coming back to the Boltzmann equation, I'm looking at the one particle. And this particle can collide with uh, many particles in the system, right? So I have to count all that possibilities. And uh, so the, now I can start write the df uh, dt, this collision term. df dt, this collision. First, if this particle is collide to other states, then I have a loss, right? You go if from original E k states to E prime k prime states, then this f, because f is representing the uh, one particle at a specific state. So I lose a particle in that state. So my first term is going out. That's a loss. So I have a negative sign. So it's going out, right? And uh, of course, that depends on, uh, say, the rate really depends. Uh, say, first I have the rate here, collision rate uh, for uh, two quantum states. But then I need to say each quantum state is how many particles I have, right? So I need to say um, uh, f, really the initial t r k. And if we collide with the other one, t r uh, uh, at the same location, k1, right? So how many in k? How many in k1? And what's the rate of going from k? k1 to k prime, k1, k1 prime. So this is where the Fermi Golden Rule tells me those are how many to start with. Okay? So this is a loss. And now, because I'm counting one specific, so I need to really say sum up all other possibility. So I need to sum up k1, I need to sum up k prime, I need to sum up k1 prime. That summation is actually, because each k is a wave vector, it's a vector, right? Is actually, each of these k is a three summation. So I have really uh, uh, nine summation, k1 is a vector, k, prime is a vector, and k1 prime is a vector. This is a loss. And then there's a gain that's going from uh, 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 the reverse. See how many k prime, k1 prime, they scatter and they scatter back into the current state of k. So the gain is from uh, T uh, R. So here, this is where the Boltzmann equation, where the molecular chaos uh, assumption we, we used before, right? So it's only interacting at the R point. So I'm not writing at different R point. I mentioned that there are modification. People try to consider the final size of the atom or molecule, like Ansgar equation. In that case, you have to add two different R points. That becomes a lot more complicated. So uh, here I have K prime. That's the from uh, uh, the uh, initial state is K prime. And T, R, same, and K1 prime, right? And they will interact and go in from K prime, K1 prime, go into K, K1. But what I care is really just uh, this one specific quantum state in K. So I need to sum again all those uh, other states. So this is a K1, K prime, K1 prime. So this summation index is the same. 
So this is out, this is in. It's, uh, I'm doing the number balance. And you put in that summation into left-hand side, uh, right-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, you get the full Boltzmann equation. <laughs> OK? Now you can say this was just a, a starter. The real thing is the complication is on the right-hand side. And uh, most time, we do not write this as a summation. You can use what you learned, how to change a summation into integration. Right? K is a sum in the quantum states. Now you need to convert that summation into integration as long as uh, all the assumption we made, uh, say, apply here. So if you convert this summation into integration, what do you have in terms of the number of integrations? Line. Each of this is a vector, right? And so you have a line less than the integrals. And of course, uh, uh, so you, when you convert state, you, you do 2L, uh, say, uh, the distance is 2 pi over L. So you, you have that distance. So you have all this constant from converting summation into integration. And you have line less than integrals. And this line less than integrals is a dk1 uh, vector. So I can write a 3. This is a dk1x, dk1y, dk1z. Right? And dk prime and the dk1 prime. So this is a, from converting summation to integration. The second comment is uh, this w. Uh, it turns out that one could argue that this w equals this w. That's a detailed balance. At the equilibrium, you know, everything has, say, is the same. Scatter out the equal scatter in. Otherwise, you have this one state that either will be depleted completely, or it goes below to infinite. Right? That's the detailed balance. So because of that, you have the equality. So you, rather than writing two terms, you can split right into combine to one term. So at the end, what I can write is scattering term df dt, say, equals, I put the negative sign, the first term in the front. I have then w and uh, f t r k and uh, f t r k1. So this is the first term minus, let me write this here. The second term is uh, say f, so minus f t r k prime and f t r k1 prime. Let me just make the, uh, uh, another comment. And uh, here I'm writing two fixed particles. When you do a real problem, whether, for example, when your electron interact with a phonon, at the end, the electron, uh, the phonon may be absorbed, right? So you don't have a phonon coming out. So for each of this specific case, you need to carefully write down this f. Here I'm just writing a generic way of uh, if I have two particles come in, collide with each other, I have two particles go out. But say, when you actually, like, you, you have a photon getting absorbed, photon disappeared. Right? So you need to do each of this case just uh, using the same idea, do your detailed expression. And so you read the different papers, different problem. This will be different expressions. OK. So now go to solve this. Yes? Oh, never mind. Um, I was just wondering, what's the point of having an integral representation of this when we're probably going to be doing this numerically? And then, because this also has to have the assumption that these functions are slowly varying, right? For like every infinitesimal step. Uh, yeah. So 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 integral equation. Uh, 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 that's true. Say um, 
you can do go back to summation. But in the, uh, remember, in the past, right, before computer was very powerful, people always tried to say whether I can solve it numerically, uh, say analytically, right? But say, uh, uh, so, so that's uh, the, um, and, and, and in fact, I say most of the time, this function doesn't change that rapidly. So that's a valid approximation. The, it's not as bad as, say, the line integral. The reason is that, you see, when you have collision, you have this delta functions, right? So it's those delta function in energy conservation and the, the delta in momentum conservation, this is also delta function, right, was significantly constrained. What are the possible values you have to consider? Okay? So that's the, see, that will uh, allow you to simplify and uh, make this still, uh, uh, see, trackable. But I have to say that Solving so full Boltzmann equation, now I'm not going to write, combine the left hand side to the right hand side, right? Uh, left hand side to right hand side. What you really have is a differential on the left, integral equation on the right, right? So even, so, even though you are solving one specific state with this K, you have to consider all the other K in your system all the quantum state in your system to solve these distribution functions. And uh, in transport, of course, if your temperature is changing, you say as a function of r, so every point you consider all the k. And you solve, you, 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 so the, the, the way that people, some people try to solve, there for each of this field, there are not many twice. It's a pretty complicated problem, right? And uh, say you typically do an iterative solution because uh, say this one is for a specific k, but this integration involves all other states, right? Your solution has to meet those, all those requirements. Okay, so it's an integral differential equation, and uh, the integration is in k-space, the differentiation in both, uh, say, uh, real space R and P, k-space, right? But th this is very hard. And uh, uh, this equation, the Boltzmann equation, is used by electrical engineer it's the foundation. You can derive all the electrical, uh, the equation electrical engineer use. And uh, it's used a lot of uh, the past literature is on gas dynamics, rarefied gas dynamics. A lot of studies in rarefied gas dynamics. Do you know the reason? Why there are so many studies in gas dynamics? This is due to Apollo project. Why? Because, uh, say, uh, uh, when you try to send the spaceship through the atmosphere, when you go outside the, uh, say, go to outer atmosphere, the pressure is very low, the molecule mean free pass is very long, so it's in the rarefied gas flow regime. So a lot of study in rarefied gas dynamics and in 1960 uh, uh, region, say, time, time scale. A lot of study in neutron. You go to look at the neutron transport, right? There are a lot of work. They just solve a neutron Boltzmann equation. So you got the neutron Boltzmann equation. You got the gas Boltzmann equation. You got the electron Boltzmann equation, right? You can do electron and a photon and photon. I teach another course of radiation transfer. At the end, we solve this equation for the photons. That's when you completely ignore the phase of the particles, of those waves. So this is a, uh, uh, that's why really there are not many equations. If you start from here, you can derive all the equations every field or most field use in, in this transport regime, right? 
but it's a molecular chaos assumption. So this is only valid when the particles are dilute. That's why so far I've been doing electron, phonon, photon molecules more on a parallel path. I can't deal, you can't use the Boltzmann equation for liquid. That's not right. OK. Now, moving on. This is a hard equation to solve. So there is a creative way to make it simple. And uh, that creative way, now we have Boltzmann equation, right? So we do relaxation time approximation. I see I can't deal with this nest in integrals. So what I'm going to write is <laughs> you will be happy. <laughs> Forget about that line integral. Okay? And this is the relaxation time. Now you will feel that we can probably do something. And this relaxation time approximation, uh, again, there are different fields, has a different name. You put in this relaxation time onto the right-hand side of Boltzmann equation. You go to verify gas dynamic or gas dynamic book. It will not be called the Boltzmann equation. It will be called the Krug equation. Right? So in the gas dynamic, that will be Krug equation. And in other field, people don't call it the Krug equation. So I remember once I was given a seminar, and uh, say uh, 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 a question was, ah, you're not solving Boltzmann equation, you're solving Krug equation. Good, at least I know who is Krug. OK, uh, what is Krug equation? OK. So uh, uh, the, uh, why it's a relaxation time? And uh, if you put it in the right-hand side, and let's forget the spatial dependence. Then what I have is df dt equals. So if your system is uniformly disturbed from an equilibrium, f0 is the equilibrium distribution. Okay? Then you can say here, if you solve this system, will return f uh, uh, to equilibrium f0 equals, say, exponential t over tau. So you can say this uh, exponentially relaxed back to equilibrium. That's why tau is called the relaxation time. Right? And uh, uh, typically, we call this uh, Boltzmann equation under relaxation time approximation. Uh, uh, Sometimes people also call the linearized Boltzmann equation, but there are some uh, uh, confusion there, I think. So now let's go to discuss what's the relaxation time, right? What's the scattered? And uh, let's look at the different relaxation times, different process, scattering. In general, when I think about the uh, uh, scattering and uh, uh, relaxation process, of course, we can say we, we mentioned before photon absorption. Right? So if I have uh, uh, before we say, okay, this is my the problem you worked on, right? This is my semiconductor with a band gap v vector, so you know it's a 3D. And uh, if I have photon comes in, excite from here to here, and uh, the photon momentum is very small. So when I do my energy conservation, this is the Electron initial uh, energy 
and this is a finest energy. And uh, final initial energy, you also have the photon energy, right? It's a two particle. So initially I have an electron at the E uh, certain energy. And initially my photon has energy H nu, right? And then finally, the electron has energy EF. So uh, I have my energy conservation is the EF minus EI. This is the initial electron energy that equals H bar omega or H nu. That's a photon energy. And uh, the momentum is KF uh, equals KI. So the final momentum of the electron plus the photon H bar uh, K of the photon. Right? And of course, the photon wavelength is a micron, typically. Right, if one micron is a 1.1 about the one electron volt, and the band gap is typically electron volt, few electron volts, or 0.1 electron volts, right? So you can say that the wavelength lambda is of the order one micron. And here, the zone boundary is pi over a. A is lattice constant, right? Lattice constant is unstrong. So you can see that, say, lambda is really doesn't shift this. The photon momentum does not shift the k much. It's just a very little change. So it's essentially a vertical transition in this case. And that's the homework problem you did. Uh, no, the, the midterm problem you did. Right? And of course, you can extend this if you do an indirect gap semiconductor like silicon. And uh, say, silicon, I have. A valence band here, conduction band is another minimum, is somewhere here. Right? This is a silicon uh, or indirect gap in general. And uh, now, when the energy of the photon is right at the gap, you can say there is no enough momentum. Right? The photon cannot lift the electron from here to here along. Because the momentum k is not enough. So what it does is you uh, will interact, uh, you actually have three particles, right? An electron interacted with the photon and interacted with the phonon. Phonon, very small energy, mini wave EV to tens of mini EV. And uh, the wave vector, on the other hand, the momentum is large. So you can write your, uh, in that case, you say, OK, my, uh, uh, the, uh, say, indirect gap, if this transition happens, you will involve, say, both electron photon and photon. Uh, EF equals EI plus H bar omega photon. And it could be plus or minus H bar omega of photon. So what I'm Plus minus means if it's a plus, it absorbs a phonon. Phonon get in. If it's a minus, a phonon emit it. Right? So that's your energy conservation. Now you have three particles involved. And uh, uh, Kf uh, equals Ki plus H bar K photon, which you can neglect. And in the case of phonon, this energy is a, a it, it still you, you should carry it if you, in your analysis, but this one is pretty small. And uh, plus minus H bar K phonon. So uh, now if you can do this problem, you should be able to do this problem using the joint density, try to write down this joint density state joint density of states, and say if you have an indirect gap semiconductor, how the absorption would change near the band gap, right? So those are the things now you can apply. And uh, 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 of course, uh, what I say, the, what the, the general behavior is for direct gap, this is your energy gap, EG. And uh, you have a very sharp rise. 
in the absorption, but the indirect gap, it could be lower for long, right? Absorption or higher, but the rate will be much smaller. Okay? And uh, that's the, we mentioned before, this is a problem of silicon when you try to use as a solar cell because this absorption is not very strong, which people means you can have to use very thick material to absorb the photon to capture it. And uh, that is the cost of the materials. Yes? Do you actually have that three body interaction? Oh, yeah. Or is it typical that you absorb first and the photon has to provide the vertical gap and then it will dissipate some of that energy? Oh, that's a, this is a very good question. Uh, it's a rate problem. Sorry? It's a rate, right? So whether it happens, if you have absorbed, and uh, 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 I think I say you probably can have some mismatch due to the uncertainty principle. But uh, I do not uh, say, so you, sometimes you can say you raise that to a virtual state. And then you need the other thing to come in, but they say that's very short. So you, you almost uh, instantaneous, you have to have that. So that, that's a lot of reason why this one is smaller, right? The scattering matrix will be weaker, and uh, the, that's in this region is smaller. Yes? If you were to provide a lattice vibration for like the indirect uh, semiconductor, right. could you theoretically convert it from indirect to direct? How, uh, oh, see, could you, what's the question again? If you were basically providing the photon for right. lattice vibration. Right. Well, uh, you, you don't have, say, this is, you can't shift this one. There are some idea how to shift it. The idea to shift it is using quantum size effect. That's the uh, first problem uh, uh, I give, say, in the quiz, the short problem. Now, when you use very small, so what happens is this one will rise, right? The, next le the first level will become here rather than at the bottom. And if it's small enough, this one rise here and be lower than that. That depends on the effective mass. It's a, if this is a sharp, this is a very, very, say the, the flat means a large effective mass. That means you need a much smaller diameter to raise it. So you have to look at the effective mass of each band. And uh, uh, of course, uh, when you make small, this will also go in down. And the sum of the, you say, uh, this is a, the first problem is that you have to consider what's going up for the conduction band, what goes down. You need to multiply when the effective mass is the same, you multiply by a factor of two. That's how you enlarge the band gap. Okay? So, uh, this is a, a, a photon. Well, maybe I can make one more comment related to a question. Right? Some people will say, okay, let me develop an intermediate band gap solar cell. Right? What does that mean? This is a band gap, right? And uh, some of the infrared photon is not absorbed because there's not enough energy. So the idea is, okay, let me develop an energy level in the gap by putting in outer atoms or quantum dots in the region, right? And then the infrared photon now can go from here to here, the first photon. And then the second photon go from here to here. It's a nice idea, but it's hard to do. Why? This is a matter of the time, residual time, right? You need the electron to here, and it has a tendency to get lost. The competition, this is all read, right? If it relax back or you interact with the photon and become heat, then you lost. So you have, uh, say, the, uh, uh, say, if you can stay there long enough, wait for the next photon to come to lift it. You can go to calculate roughly, back of in the envelope, if you have a certain photon density coming in, how long it takes for the next photon to come in with that certain energy, right? So, and the other way is, uh, say, uh, uh, there are also the so-called two-photon absorption. What happens is 
is two photons comes in at the same time, and same place, and they, it, you get that transition. But you can see in that case what they need is a very high flux, right? Because they need to come at the same time, the same location, so you need a lot of them. So long linear optics, this two photon absorption, they require a very high intensity. You use lasers to do that. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, many times you need a very high free, uh, intensity lasers to get a nonlinear regime. So it's all related to the rate, the time. When you think about what's possible, right? There's a concept there. You, this rate concept is very important, right? How fast is the process? And uh, you can dream, for example, uh, I have, uh, say, uh, some electron comes in. A photon comes in, right? I can lift the electron. Uh, say sometimes I can have absorption from here to here, free carrier absorption. And I say, okay, uh, or, or I have a high energy photon comes in, right? Because of the solar spectrum have a lot of photon like that. You raise the electron here. Isn't it good if you take this electron energy out rather than go back to here? Most solar cell, this electron will go here. Then you take it out. From here to here is about peak of second. Okay, time scale. So you look at how long it takes, uh, how one peak of second, how much electron will travel. You say that's very hard, right? So it's this rate process. Those are the uh, very important. Uh, getting this order right. So this is a, we say, OK, energy transport, energy conversion. What is it? This is energy conversion, did you say? Right? The energy is going from photon to electron. And uh, there are, of course, many competing processes. If you do a device and uh, the other process, you electron, photon, once you get the electron, and uh, photon, photon. So uh, let's look at Folon Folon. So far, uh, when we talk about Folon, we did dispersion, we did the sprint, mass sprints, right? And that's the idea of harmonic oscillator. And they do not interact if I just have harmonic oscillator. Photon is a harmonic oscillator. Photon do not interact. Okay? So it's the unharmonic term that will cause that interaction. And for photon, photon, in fact, it's hard to get the photon talk to each other, interact with each other. Like I say, nonlinear optics you need a very large flux to get them together, right? But with the photon, which is a in, the sol uh, in solid, the lattice, so say this is the potential we draw before, and the harmonic approximation is approximate this point by a parabola, right? So here is the potential, here is the distance, and uh, but say if you write down the higher order term, right? This is the minimum, and the first order is gone, one half k x minus x zero square, so that's a harmonic term. Right? And then you have an unharmonic. The next term is unharmonic. So you expand your potential using Taylor expansion. is d dx squared, uh, say, uh, x0, and uh, x minus x0 cubic. Right? Zero order, first order gone, second order, third order. You can write fourth order. Now you do your spring constant, your force. Is df du dx, right? Of course, you get your spring term, harmonic spring term. That's what we use when do the phonon dispersion. But if you go to your next term, your higher order term, you'll get the x minus x zero square, right? That's the third order term. So that gives you not a spring, linear spring, a nonlinear spring, right? Now, if you have two photons, 
each one has one specific frequency, you do their product of the two phonons, right? Omega 1 sine omega 1 times omega t 1 t times sine omega 2, uh, 2 t, what do you get? You get plus minus, right? That's a nonlinear term. So you start to have the two sine waves interact with each other if you have those nonlinear terms. Otherwise, it's just a linear superposition. They, it will never change the frequency. So this is the source of full-long, full-long interaction. And uh, the unharmonic force term gives you the part. Because of this, you can say if I have omega 1 comes in, uh, omega 2 comes in, it can go omega 3. That's a sum. So what it means is uh, 2 full long becomes 1. Or you can have 1 full long split into 2. Right, so you have the uh, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. And uh, in the process, you have energy and momentum conservation. This is h omega 1 plus h omega 2 equals h omega 3. That's for the, this one is the, uh, say, absorption process. And in Fulon language, we don't call that absorption. We say that uh, annihilation. I don't, I, OK. I say, maybe I should not pronounce that h, right? Annihilation. Right? Annihilation, you agree? And here is a creation, right? One becomes two. So this is a creation process. So uh, pre, uh, say for this, you can write the corresponding energy conservation. Now, momentum conservation is interesting. And normally, I would write h bar k1 plus h bar k2 equals h bar k3. This is a normal. And in fact, this is called normal process. OK? But normal process, that scattering I should do not create a resistance for heat flow. Why is that? <laughs> Let's think about the vector uh, format we just did. Right? So what I have, if I draw that, I see a momentum conservation. So this is a. Uh, h bar k1, h bar k2. And this is when they combine, they form h bar k3. Right, that's a normal process. Now, originally, I have h bar k1 is carrying a heat h bar omega 1. And h bar k2 is carrying heat h bar omega 2. Now, if it's a normal process, this is the final one is carrying an energy of omega 1 plus omega 2. That's the same as the original, right? And the also, the direction is the sum of the two. So essentially, the lead effect is if I have heat flow, this creates a lead heat flow in this direction. This final one is still carrying that same heat amount of heat flow in the same direction, right? So this normal process actually do not create a resistance. And what happens is, if I think about the uh, dispersion, so full-on dispersion, right, transverse non shooting And uh, so uh, you have to s consider full-on from each different branch, whether they can satisfy the energy conservation. Right, this is a K, and the specific direction at omega. And sometimes, let's say, when this one go beyond the HK1, let's say, 
and here is K2. K1, K2 go beyond the renoid zone, get a much larger K. And in that case, the crystal symmetry, the reciprocal lattice here, this point, the G, right? It could be another direction G. I'm just drawing on the same branch, but it could be completely different branch, two phonons interact, right? And the, uh, uh, if you do the wave analysis, so what's another allowable process is uh, H bar K1 plus H bar K2 equals H bar K3 plus H bar G. This G is the reciprocal lattice vector, right, in chapter uh, four, we talked about the, the Fourier transform of a crystal lattice point into a Fourier space. And this Fourier space has a corresponding lattice constant G, and that G is that G. Okay? And this process, by adding another ve uh, vector G, it could go completely different random directions. That's not the original heat flow direction. So it's this process, it still has the energy conservation, but the direction change due to the crystal say, momentum here, this created resistance, and this is called the Umklapp process. It's a German word. I think, uh, I'm not sure, say, but the, this explanation comes from Pears. Pears, uh, uh, say, was uh, um, Pears, I think, is a, he's, he's a British guy. So I don't know why, the way this is a um clamp. Okay? But see, I remember when I was a student, I actually heard a talk, a uh, seminar given by Pears. He was in the 90s at Berkeley. And uh, he told an interesting story. And he say he know uh, Landau, and uh, uh, I'm not sure, say, the Nifschitz Landau book, that's, uh, if you read through that book, uh, you understand everything. Uh, uh, say, Landau, he say Landau was uh, telling people, he say, he's a third, uh, say, he, he, he considered himself as a third read scientist, okay. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, people ask him, who is the first rate? He said, Einstein is first rate. Mm -hmm. Who is the second rate? Heisenberg or Dirac, those are first, second rate. So he's third rate. OK? Now I'm trying to read myself. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so this Unclam process create resistance for the heat flow, okay? And uh, there are diff uh, different, uh, so people have used uh, those kind of, uh, so you use the uh, uh, fermi golden rule and derive some expressions. But those, uh, for example, for Umkan process, the relaxation time uh, is, uh, one expression that's used is uh, uh, the body temperature and uh, KT, KBT, that's in the exponent, T cubic omega squared. Okay? But I want to caution you, this were actually uh, uh, done in the 50s, a lot of approximation made in those derivations. And uh, one, for example, common approximation is the by model, which is a linear approximation to the dispersion. Right? You know it's not going to be valid when you go to high frequency, high wave vectors. And uh, uh, so there are, there are different, uh, for Lohmer process, there are expression, ohm clamp process, there are approximation. And also there are unknown constants. And those constants is the scatter matrix, and uh, if you don't know, so typically people use this as a fading parameter. And uh, that's a uh, phonon phonon scattering. Now, they are saying for what other scatter phonon are the impurities, right? You have, say, 
uh, harmonic oscillator, you have silicon. And then you dope it, you dope boron, you dope phosphor, right? Those has a different mass. And uh, uh, the, uh, when, so when there are uh, waves comes in, say a different mass, they'll be scattered. And this scattering is typically, so impurity scattering, And uh, remember, last time I say phonon phonon scattering is, a com is a, you can treat it as a complete phase randomizing because you pop up here, pop up there, you can't fix the position, right? But then we have impurity scattering, those impurity atoms are fixed. It's just that you can't, you normally don't know where they are, right? And uh, the impurity scattering form is typically written as a force power, inverse. Here you can say I all write humorous. Okay. So, in fact, uh, this is a result not uh, derived. It's a result from light. And if you look at the sky, it's a blue sky. And that's because the light is scattered by the density fluctuation of the gas or small particles. And uh, so when you have small atoms or small particles, you can say the higher frequency, uh, this tau, tau is uh, the this is a tau, right? Tau itself is uh, smaller. The left uh, the relaxation time. That means it's scattered more often, right? So that's why the sky is blue, right? That's the relay scatter. This is a relay scatter. Acoustic waves and uh, say optical waves, they all have those characteristics. But say uh, it's not completely sure what, in what regime this is uh, applicable for acoustic, for atomic waves. And this is uh, still uh, uh, some uh, debate there. Right? And finally, this is a boundary. There's also a boundary. If they, there's no scattering, it hits the boundary, there's boundary scattering. And that's the one that will actually solve Boltzmann equation using this as a boundary condition of Boltzmann equation. We, we can trade it more rigorously. But typically in the past, people we do is when you have different relaxation time, you patch them together, right? Particularly if they are all randomly distributed in the volume, and you do this uh, total tau equals the different process inverse. So it's a more resistive one. The more frequently scattered one, that will be dominant. Right? Because this is all inverse. And this is the Matheson rule. OK. So that's how you put all these different processes together. One final comment. So here is the phonon phonon scattering, and then you have electron phonon scattering. Right? <clears throat> we have an electron has certain energy, interact with the phonon, get into a different energy. E, E prime, and uh, also in the process you have the energy momentum conservation. And this scattering, of course, you deal with electron transport. That's very important, right? Electric engineers always try to improve their mobility, try to make a faster device. You want to reduce the phonon scattering. And uh, um, <clears throat> so the uh, the uh, one thing I want to comment here is, uh, of course, the energy change process. If the, there's energy change, it's inelastic, right? The energy is not conserved. Uh, so the, the particle energy change during the scatter. And uh, the uh, impurity scattering, like uh, the relay scattering, we typically, these are the elastic scatter. Elastic scatter frequency doesn't change. 
And in fact, uh, rigorously speaking, rigorously speaking, for all inelastic scattering process where the energy change, that approximation, the relaxation time approximation is not valid. We do it all the time, but this actual rigorous is not valid. So you go, once we go to chapter eight, we have one more step. Well, let's suppo suppose you split this, uh, say, into two terms rather than just a relaxation term. So that's when we deal with the electron phonon and the line equilibrium between electron phonon. OK, so uh, I think uh, uh, I will stop on this topic. And now I think uh, we come to the stage, I would say you should pick up the, as I said at the beginning, any journal. And uh, you should not be, uh, say, you are say that uh, you should not be afraid of reading, right? I'm, I'm sure that you can't understand everything. But uh, what I'm hoping is uh, 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 there are always things uh, that help you to, to get some idea of, of those uh, different uh, many, many uh, papers. So um, let's take a quick look. So say all the, I think I have covered most of the basic concepts. And uh, uh, the rest is, uh, if you read paper, of course, uh, say the concept that need time to digest. And uh, well, I was, uh, I was uh, quickly look at, uh, let's say, nano letter. Now, you can look at all, I would say you should look at all the nano journals. Hmm. Uh, this is a two. OK, so uh, uh, silicon nano wire, this is more the uh, uh, device related, right? Uh, I thought uh, we can look at the current issue. Where is the current issue? More materials, uh, so you really make how to make a material. So that, that's a relatively easy, right? Um, uh, okay, for example, if you go to the next one, this paper by David Smith, uh, he was the guy who first did the negative refraction experiment. And the surface plasmons, right? And if you look at the title, low quality to to surface plasma resonance, and you heard the surface plasma, you can read and see what, what, the, what it means. What's it doing? And uh, if I look at this one, right? Uh, I didn't open, but you can go to check whether I guessed it is right. Uh, so if I look at this uh, uh, electric breakdown on off state, electric switch sustainable graphene junction, uh, probably there, okay, breakdown. Uh, of course, they, they, uh, it can um, create the gaps, but there also could be tunneling phenomena if you have very small lateral gaps, right? electron tunneling. I don't know whether the paper will deal with those issues. Right? And uh, that's where I stopped. Water, you have to wait. When we do the linear, more Einstein treatment, linear response theory, and uh, uh, 
when you look at battery, one concept that I'll go into, not directly on battery, but you have to understand what is the electrochemical potential. Okay. And uh, uh, conducting uh, graphene, uh, nanocubes. Nano so I, I, I guess to say my message to you is now you go to this uh, journal and try to say, read through the title and guess what it's doing. Uh, you, uh, and, and then you pull out a few <laughs> papers and you try to read through uh, uh, the, the, the content. It, not of you as a, a concern. Uh, does this help you pass the call? And say, the call is asking to read papers. Right? And you see there, we'll ask you questions. So <laughs> that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, it should help. But, uh, no guarantee. <laughs> okay?